We know you've written these incredible scores for alien worlds like Close Encounters or E.T. or Star Wars. And you are also able to so beautifully capture many different musical cultures from here on Earth and always in your own unique voice. For instance, Empire of the Sun or Amistad or Schindler List or Memoirs of a Geisha. What process do you use to get this inspiration for this specific and quite special different styles of music? Many years ago, I wrote a flute concerto, sometime in the 1970s, in which I tried to have a concert modern flute imitate the sounds of shakuhachi, which is the Japanese flute, which even back in those years, I was fascinated by the, the sounds and the mysticism that this, to us, would mean, because it would be unfair to call it a primitive instrument. It doesn't have the, the chromaticism and the complexities of a modern flute, but it can conjure fantastic... Uh, atmosphere, even though I don't understand the language or exactly what the atmosphere may perhaps con would connote, but I always loved it. But it's interesting because you have an immense culture of music, you are extremely good pianist, trained at Juilliard, and you've heard so much music, but um, I'm very curious about, indeed, uh, which music do you listen to when you have to write different styles? Do you actually travel and go listen to some music? You have uh, some a collection of LPs, of CDs. I mean, which music do you listen to? I must say, most of the time, Stefan, in my life, I'm writing something. I'm writing a movie now, I'm writing another piece now, and so on and so forth. So I really listen to very little music, because when I'm composing something, it's really a 24-hour day. How, what am I going to do in this thing? What will I do here? What is needed there that I can do? And so it's not very helpful to listen to Brahms or something else that's where the music is probably better than mine to begin <laughs> with, <laughs> and, and it wouldn't be any help. Certainly, occasionally, I will listen to music, particularly in the case of geisha. But most of the time, I must confess, I hear far less repertoire than I'd like to hear, particularly contemporary music. There's so much wonderful contemporary music around. I occasionally hear something that is so beautifully done. Many, many younger composers, but it's hard to hear it. The score, the romantic score you wrote for Dracula, uh, is a recent discovery for me. And uh, you actually were writing this score in a time of your life where you, you were gaining huge success and awards for Star Wars, for Jaws, for Close Encounters, for Superman. And um, I would like to know what is uh, your special affection for this score and what is the signature style we should hear in uh, Listen For in this? Uh, first of all, uh, I think of Dracula occasionally out of the score, and I thought, ah, the conductor I would like to have to conduct this piece is Stefan Deneau. Oh. So I thought, uh, maybe he will conduct it if I suggest it, you know, because I probably, people do not know it. The production was by Walter Mears, who was a friend of mine for many, many years ago. He produced Fiddler on the Roof. I worked with him in, in many other films. And he came along, he's doing Dracula, and he has Frank Langella, who did Dracula on Broadway. And I think it was the first time in the history of Dracula, as far as I know, that we had a very handsome young man playing Dracula, who was very, very attractive. And in the score, there is a scene where Dracula comes together with the girl played by Kate Nelligan, which I thought was such a poetically erotic uh, scene. And we recorded the music with the orchestra, I think. And, uh, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and, and I loved the scene, watching the scene. And the difficulty was that Mr. Mirish then said, oh, we have to cut it because Universal Pictures thinks it's too erotic. It was too explicit, too much to see. So unfortunately, the music was cut a little bit and made me very sad because I thought this was a very beautiful moment. But this is a, a sort of love theme that can be beautiful and lyrical, but it's also a little bit frightening. Is it true, this story, that uh, the end of E.T. actually was remade uh, just because you indeed couldn't <laughs> find really the right, right. agogic, the right rubato, and that you stopped the movie and you just recorded it first and the movie was edited on your music? Is that true? It's true. i put it another way, Stefan. I couldn't conduct it. <laughs> I, I, I was trying over and over again. It's a long sequence, about 10 minutes, and every bar has something 
something to match here. And if it doesn't match on the screen, it, it, it doesn't have its effect, it doesn't really look right. And I made, I don't know how many takes, how many performances, attempts to do this. I couldn't, I couldn't get it right. So Steven Spielberg, who's the director of this thing, finally said to me, John, just play the music. I know it fits. It has exactly the uh, silhouette of the action. You have the orchestra play it, was comfortable, and I will recut the film to the orchestral performance, which he did. And I have a feeling, Stefan, but I think it's a serious hunch that something about the end of that movie, which is so moving, it's almost kind of operatic in a way, with the children and so on, I have to think that some of that emotion that we get is because the orchestra was allowed to play without any inhibition. Yes. And I think, first of all, Mr. Spielberg, he saved, saved my life because I wasn't getting it right. <laughs> but I think in the process, we got something better. Indeed. The very first time I cried in a movie theater was thanks to you, to your music, and uh, to the movie E.T. I was 11, it was 1982. And, uh, I love this piece of music. I mean, it's really my favorite, and uh, uh, I'm so impressed by its great melodies. And the melodic aspect of your art is, for me, extremely fascinating. Uh, you wrote so many fantastic melodies, but this one, for instance, for E.T., do you remember when this melody appeared to you? Is it something that you sketch first, you tweak and, and, and improve, or it just arrives right away? Uh, and do you notice actually the power of a melody right away? How does this melody come to you? For me, the process usually is I would start working on the film, and the first week or two, I have no idea what I'm doing. So, you know, and, and eventually, something begins to codify and form shape. In the case of E.T., uh, the main melody, really, I think I was trying to find something that had lift to it. That's easy enough. We're going to be going to ascending melodically on the piano. Uh, the, the opening phrase, it's very just a white key, very simple, very dull. Very natural, if you think about it, to go da -de 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 -de, up a tone, you know, not even diatonic tone, but up will shift a key, finally da -de -de, all the way up. So it is this ascending thing. I don't know how it came, really. I probably, I use the piano a lot in my writing, probably more than a professor would tell me to do. But uh, so a lot of it is, comes from improvisation, and I will write notes, as you suggested, and change them, sketch them a little bit sketch them a lot, sometimes taking a note out, putting another note in, and finally you get something and you say, ah, oh, this is uh, clear. This sounds like it's, it, it belongs in this thing. It belongs to the film. Personally, I feel that sometimes um, some of your melodies are so perfect that uh, it seems to me that you were like an archaeologist that they, they already existed in the world and you just... Well, that could be a good thing. If it, if it seems like something we know, something that is in, the, in our... Com collective communication, you know, that we discover anew together, and it put it that way. I also have to say, though, Stefan, in films, I mean, there are certain films that where you don't want a melody per se. So, you know, a director will not want it, or it, music should be only atmospheric and not, not have a linear uh, rhetoric to it, which suggests uh, all kinds of things for people. And uh, there are examples of that where we actually want to avoid anything like that, anything like a direct diatonic melody that is very hummable, if you like, or singable, you know. The wonderful thing about film is it gives you so many opportunities to be a chameleon, which is to say change from Mimosa to Geisha to Superman. Nothing to do with each other whatsoever, but you have to create, try to create something that's atmospheric and thematic and, and the texture that will accompany what we see. What I found very fascinating is to sometimes see a scene of a movie without your music mm -hmm. and it can sound so empty and so meaningless or feeling less and then if we add your music it's just a no totally different feel um, so how does that work because of course you always had the film without the music first mm -hmm. so um, how does it work how do you do you do you write the pacing how do you decide where it should be music, where not, and, and, and how is the organization of, of writing music for, for, for a film? Uh, we remember Jaws when the boat is going out to hunt the animal. Yes. 
and there's no music. It's very quiet, and they're going about their business, playing cards and fishing, and one of the crew members is chumming, I think is the English word for it, of bait, you know, to catch the fish into the water. And the shark comes and takes the, takes the bait, and they see the shark, and they're shocked, and the music begins. And, and what the music will do is give us a sense of the, the size and thread of this shark. The man says, you need a bigger boat. This thing is so big. And the process of the, of the three or four minutes, the most dramatic part of it is that the, Richard, you will see Richard Dreyfus getting a sound device to track how far the shark is and how deep it is. And he needs to get it attached to the rope on the barrels. We will all, we'll see this in the film. And the tension is that he's ready to shoot the harpoon, and the, the, and the timing device is not hooked to the rope. Mm. Quickly, quickly, we have to get the you know, and, and the shark is getting closer, and the man is fr further away from the rope. We have this thing, and the music will go, today we get, go into a kind of mind-numbing repetition, almost like the shark theme, you know, to uh, getting louder and louder as the shark gets closer and the, and the synchronization gets worse. Finally, they will hit the shark with this harpoon, attaching the rope and the sounding device to the animal. And, and the shark will swim by, and the orchestra makes a gesture of size, which we will play in the orchestra, exactly as he swims by. And as he swims out, attached to the line, the boat turns around, and there's a sense of heroicism and success. And we have an orchestral fanfare to tell us, ah, we have achieved what we want to do. And of course, the shark is so strong and powerful, he goes f f far and farther away, and the orchestra goes, and finally, he, he's so strong, he will pull the barrel down and disappear, and the music just kind of collapses as the, as the tension is all released. And uh, there are little cues in, in the middle where he's attaching the sound device that become very little attention-getting accents from the orchestra. So if we get all this in sync, uh, the size of the shark, the sighting of the shark, this tension between line and harpoon, and, and uh, getting the ship around in position and so on. It's l like a little ballet scene, and within three or four minutes, there are probably 20 little episodes that the orchestra has to participate in. And we can play it without the music, and it's very good. But with the music, it becomes uh, more of a... a uh, a colorful uh, experience for the audience, they, they will probably not hear the music at all. We can understand that. The audiovisual is such that the visual will overpower the audio. But without it, we don't have the full experience of, of the fun of this hunt. Fantastic. And I've been lucky enough to see some manuscripts of your movie oh. and, um, and saw the cue sheet. And that was also Amazing. So first you write like every second almost what's happening and then people don't know how many cues you are following and how many little details in the music changes to follow indeed the movie. And speed. You know, we, we may start at this speed, but when, the sh when this action happens, the rope is connected to something, it gets quicker. We know exactly a minute and 22 seconds is when it starts to accelerate. But we want to accelerate, as the film editing accelerates, if it does, the, qu the cuts in the film may become quicker, or if, if they are stable, the action is becoming quicker and accumulating some tension. So you need to have a sense of the rhythm of the choreography and, sh and camera work of the film. This is the art, and the, maybe not art, Stefan, it's certainly a craft. I just want to say the contributions of orchestras to films. The virtuosity is an aspect of virtuosity in these films that, that is unnoticed by the audience. And that's why a concert, if you can do it, have a great orchestra do a concert with or without film, the audience can understand what a partner musical virtuosity is in the manufacture of these films. And I thank you because I would go so far as saying that you saved the symphony orchestra to keep present in the popular culture because indeed, thanks to you, I think all the great movies of Hollywood, the big blockbusters, they need symphonic music because you made the reference of what the emotion can be from a symphony orchestra for the movies. It, it is true, and the brilliance that they bring to it, you know, the, the absolute, I'd say again, virtuosity that comes there that is, can be often largely unnoticed, but def desperately needed. So we are very proud of them, and, and it's great fun. It really is great fun, particularly the recording part of it. Writing many weeks, sometimes, oh, that's hard. But my, my reward is to go in and conduct the orchestra and listen to them play. John, over those 
two weeks of music, we uh, are celebrating your concert music. You wrote many, many great pieces for the concert platform, many concertos. And is that a different process for you when you start a piece which will not be for a film? Uh, do you just change your way of thinking? What, what is the difference? Writing for non-film music is certainly a different mental process, I think, for me or for anyone else, because we don't have a script. We don't have a definite period style suggested. It, it can be anything. And of course, that's much harder because we have we have a we, the universe is a palette of what to do, and I have always written concert music away from films for the main reason to discover a sense of renewal to get to get away from an assignment that I had to do and and uh, enjoy myself perhaps or indulge myself maybe is a better way of putting it in in writing in most cases pieces for a certain individual or a certain orchestra and. Uh, Violin Concerto, of course, I've written many years ago, and that was written in, in quite a romantic style, which, which my late wife was particularly enthusiastic about in terms of violin uh, music, which she loved. It is somewhat tuneful, I guess you could say, in a romantic style. I know you're going to play my cello concerto, which I've written for Yo-Yo Ma, which was written for the occasion of the opening of Ozawa Hall at Tanglewood. And I think my mindset there is to try to suggest, to have the temerity to try to suggest that I might contribute something for the cello and orchestra that isn't exactly already in the repertoire. Now, I, 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 I would never attempt to displace Dvorak or 20th century concerti, Elgar, oh my God, absolute masterpiece, I think, and many other more contemporary works. But I thought, what can I do for Yo-Yo that would perhaps be something a little bit fresh if I can have the audacity to try to contribute that? And uh, what a reward to be able to have an artist like Yo-Yo look at it and say, yes, I will play it. It's fabulous. You know, nothing could be better. So I, what, what time I have had to devote to that, I have enjoyed, and it's been part of my... Uh, not only part of my entertainment, but part of my attempts to try to expand my horizons, perhaps, if you like, educate myself a little bit in terms of, of uh, expression away from particular subjects and, and narratives of the film. Do you feel you are even more true to yourself because you don't have to, you know, to follow a theme, to follow something? I, I really don't know, Stefan. I don't know what represents my soul, whatever that may be, if there is one. Uh, more, a big one. more completely different approach to film music. There's probably some connection. I mean, there, there are things we all write letters and our handwriting is inescapable. It's our thumbprints are quite inescapable. And uh, the consequence of that is that our limitations and strengths are probably always with us. My, my friend, the late Bernard Herrmann, who many people will remember, as a great film composer, among other things, he's always saying, you know, composers don't improve. They are themselves. They are what they are. Mm -hmm. And that is probably true, really, in the end. You can contribute what you can. Music is so fabulous. You know, I would, I can just give you what is now a cliche, but it's a great quote of Rachmaninoff's, who says, you know, he said finally that a lifetime of uh, music is enough for a lifetime, but no lifetime is enough for music. Music is, for me, our greatest gift. We are so glad you're here. Thank you very much for all of that, John, and we love you. Stefan, congratulations Merci. on your great art and many, many years of making beautiful music. You will. Thanks for doing all of this. You do me great honor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bravo. you, John.